Paper Mario. It's a series nobody thought would become quite as popular as it became. The original Paper Mario's new take on the RPG formula left people in awe with its cute graphics and oddly fun turn-based combat. It spawned multiple sequels and a huge fan following. It's revered by many, myself included, as one of the best collection of games ever made. But before I get ahead of myself, let's start this review at the very beginning. The Paper Mario series began its life as a sequel from Super Mario RPG, but because of issues between Nintendo and Square Enix, the original product never saw the light of day. So Nintendo teamed up with Intelligent Systems to create a brand new IP. You may have heard of Intelligent Systems before. They've worked on legendary titles such as Metroid, Fire Emblem, and WarioWare. Some of the most creative games were made by these guys, especially WarioWare, because those games can get crazy at times, which actually turned out to be a good fit for the studio later on. What the two teams came up with was Paper Mario, which was released on the Nintendo 64 in the year 2001. I'll be referring to the first Paper Mario as Paper Mario 64, just so things don't get confusing on later in the video. So, the story of the game is very simple for a Mario game. Bowser steals the Star Rod, which is a magical wand that grants wishes. Peach is captured, and Mario must collect seven stars in order to defeat Bowser with the rod. While this is like the hundredth time the scenario is played out, a Mario game has never felt quite as adventurous before. The world has never felt so alive. Enemies that Mario would usually kill at a second's thought become citizens of the Mushroom Kingdom. Mario meets these citizens, and some of them even become partners of him to help stop Bowser. A majority of these partners, though, in this game feel a little forced in and forgettable at times. Some, for no reason at all, decide that they want to help Mario defeat evil because, lol, why not? It's not like death is a factor or, or anything. Slow. Agonizing. DEATH! Bo the Boo is an absolute boss, though. She literally bitch slaps every enemy she comes in contact with, and does a surprising amount of damage. It's freaking sweet. The humor of this game is great. Bowser has some of the best bits in this game. His diary expressing his schoolgirl-like crust for the princess being my personal favorite. Paper Mario 64 plays off of Bowser and Peach's relationship perfectly. The game realizes that pretty much all Bowser wants to do is pound that Peach, so to speak. And the dialogue reflects that in an E-rated way. Where this game truly shines, though, is the combat. It takes the phrase, easy to learn, hard to master, and sticks by its side the entire time. The combat is incredibly simple. You press A when you're about to jump on an enemy to jump on them again. Simple stuff. As the game goes on, though, the tactics get more difficult. Some enemies are immune to certain attacks, though, and require careful planning in order to survive. You can't just go in willy-nilly and stomp on all the enemies and expect to win. If you don't fully learn how to play the game three-fourths of the way in, you're gonna be in for a rough ride. Again, Bo the Boo is a fucking pimp that backhand of hers. Pow, pow, pow. The final boss fight is the pinnacle of what I meant by how hard this game can get if you don't get good. Bowser is tough. While most games give you a wimpy final boss fight, Paper Mario 64 throws everything it's got at you with no care in the world. I hope you don't mind watching long cutscenes over and over and over again, because Bowser can be a real pain in the ass to learn how to beat. Once he's defeated, his castle is destroyed and Peach's castle floats back down to Earth in a bubble. At the very bottom, the stars thank Mario for saving the world, and then there's a parade because, hey, why not? The game was a true successor to Super Mario RPG, and fans rejoiced. Paper Mario 64 took what people loved about the Mario universe and RPGs and crammed them into one ultimate continuum of a game. People wanted a sequel so badly, and Nintendo agreed with them. When news broke of a new Paper Mario game three years later, fans were excited. The game they had been waiting for for years was coming, but a thought remained in the back of their minds. Could this game truly match that of the first one? Then BLAM! The Thousand Year Door came out of nowhere and kicked Paper Mario 64 to the ground and yelled, This isn't how you do a Paper Mario game, THIS IS HOW YOU DO A PAPER MARIO GAME! The Thousand Year Door improves on its predecessor in every single way. It's how a sequel should be, 
It expands on what made the original so great, but added in a few new bits to make it feel new and fresh. The characters are more fleshed out, making each one of them unique and interesting. The combat is improved, the world is improved, the music is great, everything about this game is awesome. To this day, this game still holds up because of its art style. It's timeless. Hell, even the original does to some extent. So, the story of this game is a little bit of the same as Paper Mario 64. Peach has been kidnapped, and in order to save her, Mario must collect the seven star- Oh no, wait, I'm sorry. <clears throat> seven crystal stars in order to open up the Thousand Year Door. The seven stars are scattered all over the land, leading to many diverse locations. But what makes this so interesting is that the kidnapper isn't Bowser this time, but a brand new faction called the x Knots. The humor is something to listen to in this game, with all the wacky things that happen in this game. Bowser still has that large ego of his, and leads to some of the funniest lines in the game. There's also a computer that likes to watch Peach while she showers. Hey, I never said this game wasn't weird at times. Mario is pretty much the creator of the video game trope of man saves woman from bad guy, but leave it to the same guy's game of all things to freshen it up a bit. In this game, Mario goes to a wrestling arena, an island full of dead pirates, a Sherlock Holmes type of mystery aboard a train, and even goes to the freaking moon to fight space Nazis. You aren't stuck in the same forest, desert, and snow land this time. These unique parts of the Thousand Year Door are my favorite moments in the game. Just like the original though, its combat is simple, yet hard to master. But the action is super smooth this time around. Mario's partners this time around have a life bar now, and that means they can take hits for Mario if he's low on health. If you thought Bowser from Paper Mario 64 is tough, then oh baby, are you in luck. Or should I say, unluck? Ah! No? Okay. After Paper Mario collects all seven crystal stars, he opens the Thousand Year Door and finds the leader of the x Knots, Grotus. With Peach, he awakens the demon locked away behind those doors, the Shadow Queen. But the Shadow Queen destroys Grotus and possesses Peach. The Queen lets off dark magic and engulfs the world in darkness. All of your training is led up to this final boss, and it's one hell of a challenge to complete. But of course, Mario defeats the Queen and saves the world, again. And the world returns to the light it's used to. Now that I think about it actually, this game is a little bit identical to Paper Mario 64. While the Thousand Year Door is a lot better than Paper Mario 64, it does copy a little bit. For example, there's a cookie mini game in the very first game where Peach has to bake a cake for 30 seconds or else King Blub Blub over here won't like it. The Thousand Year Door does the same thing, but with a potion this time. Hell, even your first two partners are pretty much copy and paste of the first two from Paper Mario 64. But that doesn't matter at all because the Thousand Year Door is considered by many the pinnacle of the series, and I agree with them. Never before did I want to complete a game to 100%. I was admittedly kind of sad when the adventure was over and Mario had to say goodbye to all of his friends. I didn't want the game to be over. Luckily, the adventure doesn't have to end right there, as Mario can complete anything he missed by reloading the save file, which involves him going back to Rogueport and getting all of his party members again, which is pretty cool to see. Also, every girl in Mario's party totally wanted his dick. So Nintendo did what was surely a hard, but not impossible task of going far past the original in its sequel. And fans could absolutely not wait for the third part. The next part has a somewhat mixed reception among the fanbase. Super Paper Mario for the Wii. The game opens up like all the others with Mario and Luigi at their house, relaxing. Aw, look, even Mario's past crews are present in pictures in the background. The memories. Until then comes screaming that Peach has been captured. What a surprise. Well, apparently it's a surprise to Mario and Luigi because they legit cannot figure out who would do such a thing for like 30 seconds. Hmm, who's getting that Peach a couple hundred times now? I just can't put my finger on it. By this point, I'm sure she's lived with Bowser more than she slept in her own bed. Like, seriously. After finally realizing Bowser probably did it, they rush to his castle only to find him just preparing to raid the Mushroom Kingdom and him Peachless. Only a couple of seconds later, Peach comes in from another dimension and a new villain, Count Bleck, appears. 
He knocks Mario out and sucks everyone but Mario into a vortex. Shortly later, Bowser finally gets his dream of marrying Peach. Look, this dude just really wants a Bowser Jr. That, that's all I'm gonna say about it. Unfortunately for Bowser, the wedding's only purpose is to spawn the Chaos Heart for Count Black. Meanwhile, Mario wakes up to a pixel named Tippy. She takes him to a man named Merlin, who tells Mario that he has to collect eight pure hearts. Nice job, Nintendo. Eight of the fill in the blanks instead of seven this time. And hey, it's hearts this time. Not even stars. Progress. But if Mario is unable to collect all hearts in time, the void that was created by the Chaos Heart will destroy all worlds. When I first laid eyes on Paper Mario, it went a little something like this. What? What is this? Oh, what the hell is that? What the f fuck is that? Why is this a Paper Mario game? I couldn't believe that Nintendo would just give us a subpar platformer as a sequel to one of the best RPGs ever made. I just come from the Thousand Year Door and was disgusted, betrayed even. It wears the skin of a Paper Mario game, but it was just an imposter. We got a terrible 2D to 3D mechanic that has a timer on it. What happens if the timer runs out? Well, you take damage for absolutely no reason, and the timer, I swear to god, has the slowest recharge rate I have ever seen in a game. Now that I think about it, why is there even a timer in the first place? I can't think of a moment in the game where having an infinite timer would have made, I don't know, something unbalanced or whatever. I can't think of one. Then there's the odd selection of characters. You can go between Peach, Bowser, and Luigi, but you will never play as them unless you need to solve a puzzle because they don't have the 2D to 3D ability that Mario has, which is integral to the game, so there's pretty much no point of even playing as them. The button to cause the 3D mode to activate doesn't even do anything when he plays these three, so why can't they use it as well? In combat, Mario can just do anything his friends can do, other than Bowser's fire breath. Hell, Bowser can't even climb freaking ladders because his arms are too stubby. The pixels you find along your journey have no personality other than when you initially find them. It was an attempt to keep the partner system alive, but it ended up failing as I didn't care about my pixels that I found at all. And don't even get me started on Tippy's ability. All she does is find hidden objects and tattles on enemies. That's it! That's all she does! Not only is this extremely annoying to go all over the map thinking that I'm a fucking idiot for missing a door, only to go back to the room that I was stuck in to find an invisible door which leads me to calling myself a goddamn idiot, but it serves no purpose! Why do these things have to be invisible? Nothing would have been taken away from the game if this mechanic wasn't there. Some of the best parts of this game were actually when Tippy wasn't around with that annoying ability at first. Yada yada yada, chapter one, snore. Chapter two, Eh, it was okay. Oh god, no, don't. Oh no. Oh. Chapter 3 was. Wait, chapter 3. Hold on a second. This is what hope feels like, doesn't it? This chapter was the true turning point in the game. It got good. Really good. You meet this guy named Francis, who is a massive nerd. Way to go after your audience, Nintendo. Francis, at the very start of the level, sucks up Tippy and takes her to his house. Let's just say Francis has a thing for butterflies. When you finally get into Francis's room, you're greeted to a dating sim between him and Peach, which might be one of the funniest parts in a Paper Mario game to date. This game is from 2007. I didn't even know dating sims were even popular back then. After the chapter ends, the story starts to pick up. The game realizes what it wants to be. Super Paper Mario quits being a platformer and turns into a quirky puzzle game with the most complex story a Paper Mario game has ever told. Think of the wrestling arena and train section from the Thousand Year Door, and cram them all into one game, and this is what you get. I did a complete 180 from bleh to oh my god this is so good. Suddenly I started to care about the characters around me. Tippy pretty much pulled a minute from Twilight Princess and goes from being pretty dull to pretty freaking awesome. I actually started to care about this little butterfly. Now, Tippy, I love you, but your ability is still annoying as hell to deal with. Seriously, why is that even in the game? Did you have to somehow make some use of the Wii Remote? Was that the whole point of it, just so the Wii Remote didn't feel useless? I hate it. I hate it. Near the end of the game, it starts getting dark and emotional at times. Two things that I never thought I'd say about a Mario game. This game held so much back in the first two chapters that you'd honestly believe these were two different games. 
Chapters 3 through 8 are an absolute blast with extremely witty dialogue and clever ideas. Though, I'm gonna be real about the story's plot twist. There was absolutely no subtlety at all. It was hinted at at the end of chapter 4, but became so painfully obvious by chapter 6 that the twist was Tippy and Black were once lovers. That I'm a little shocked that nobody at Intelligent Systems realized that they were spelling subtly in all capital letters with blinking lights all around it. The end of the game involves Mario and friends defeating the Count, but everybody refuses to kill him because Tippy can't bring herself to do it. But the Count needs to die or else the Void will not stop growing. Then the game reveals the true villain of the game, Dimentio. He takes control of the Chaos Heart for himself, which nobody has a problem killing, I mean they murder the shit out of him. Even though Dimentio is defeated, he still lingers on and the Void grows larger, destroying worlds. To stop it, however, Black says that him and Tippy must get married. Unfortunately, by doing this, they would both end up potentially dying. When I heard this, I legitimately threw my hands up in the air and verbally said, No, come on! Black and Tippy sacrifice themselves by getting married and stop the void in its tracks with the power of love, which is literally one of the most Japanese things I have ever heard, restoring the destroyed worlds in the process. Yet again, Mario has saved the world. But this time, it wasn't just him. Tippy and Black were the true main characters of the story. The writers went all out on this game, and they succeeded with flying colors. My only gripe with the ending of the game is that it feels like there wasn't enough closure. The games before it had a where are they now type of ending, but the end of the game involves everyone getting lunch and Peach telling Merlin that she's sure that Tippy and Black are still alive somewhere. Which, to be fair, the the end screen does show Black and Tippy, who is oddly human now, alive on a new world. So, you know, it gets a pass. Now, I want to say something before the next bit. It's really hard to get me emotional. The Walking Dead games and Tales from the Borderlands are the only games that have ever gotten a tear from me. When the finale for Super Paper Mario came, it kind of went like this. I mean, yeah, that was sad, but... I was kind of expecting a little bit more. I think my throat's starting to dry up a little. I don't know what it is about this music, but it gets to me, and I love it. It feels like everything this game is about is crammed up into this musical piece. Leave it to Dracula and a butterfly falling in love to get me feeling sad. There's quite a few pieces of music that surprise me in the here in a Mario game. I think it's easy to say that this game has some of the best music in the series. The sign of a good story is when you replay a game and connect all the story elements at the beginning of the game. Seriously, this shit, it made no sense in the beginning. But over time, it became integral to the story, and the text at the end generally started to creep me out with Black's transformation into the villain that he became. Rereading these texts after completing the game makes you realize how much of a tragedy this game's backstory is. This game hits you on such an emotional level that it catches you off guard. The fact that this is a Mario game even makes you even more caught off guard. To put it into perspective what I'm talking about, imagine if one day a Spongebob episode involved the characters dealing with day the day real life struggles such as death and regret. I mean, in this game, you go to a place that's pretty much hell, witness a civilization polluting water which is causing its wildlife to die, and even you see slavery and even are a slave for a short period of time. That's how real Super Paper Mario can get at times, and it feels like the Majora's Mask of the Paper Mario series. It was so unexpected, and it did something so much different than its older brother, The Thousand Year Door. The story is much more deep than it first appears. The game shows the many different sides of how people react to dealing with loss and how they cope with it. So, in conclusion, because I could honestly talk about this game all day. If I could describe this game in a sentence, I'd say it grows on you. From the story to the music, you start to get into it. Yes, this wasn't the Paper Mario game we were all expecting. If this game had had the classic Paper Mario gameplay, it would have been so much better in all aspects of the Thousand Year Door. In the end though, I'm fine with how the game ended up as I had a blast playing through it. This game solidified Paper Mario as one of my favorite franchises. The Thousand Year Door made me love the games, but Super Paper Mario pulled me in and made me truly appreciate the games as a whole. 
Nintendo has truly made something special. The Paper Mario series was up there with the greats such as Zelda. Three masterpieces in a row. I'd never cared about a series like I did Paper Mario. But it felt like Super Paper Mario was more of a spin-off than anything. And that Intelligent Systems' next Paper Mario will be the one that we are all waiting for. And then they fucked it up! It wasn't a side-scrolling Paper Mario that fucked it up. That game was actually the biggest surprise of the century of how good it was, but it was a game that returned to its roots. Sticker fucking star. Holy shit. Hold on, I, I need to gain control of myself. <sighs> I've heard the horror stories of Sticker Star, but I could not believe them. I didn't want to believe. The first three games were masterpieces. I... I had to see it for myself. How could they fuck up a series that had been up to that point? A brilliant show of gameplay and storytelling. I recently bought my very first 3DS, so I put down the $40 and bought Sticker Star. God have mercy on my soul, for only the devil himself could create a creature so foul. So the story starts with the Mushroom Kingdom celebrating the Sticker Fest. On that very night, people make wishes to a comet known as the Sticker Comet. Mario is in the crowd while Peach is doing her thing up on the stage, only to have Bowser come out of nowhere and touch the comet. The comet splits into six sticker crowns, which Bowser ends up getting one of them, causing him to turn into a sticker version of himself, and completely fucks up the festival, sending toads flying in all directions. If the plot is sounding somewhat familiar to Paper Mario 64, don't worry, we'll get there eventually. Mario and Bowser get into a battle with Bowser knocking Mario out. Mario then wakes up the next day. Hey, Mario, you doing okay there, buddy? You're, you're not looking so good there. Anyways, a sticker named Kirsty comes to him and tells him that they need to collect all six of the crowns in order to restore the comet back together. So Mario, and I shit you not, spends the next 20 minutes pulling toads off the side of walls. Oh yeah, and this toad gets absolutely squashed. In the arms of the angel, fly away from here. I know it feels like I'm skipping a lot of the story, but literally, that's everything. I'm scratching the edges to give you guys the rundown of the story. This game has no story, it feels more like a classic Mario game than a Paper Mario game. But, I'm gonna talk about the positives first, and stay far away from the negatives for a while, because honestly, we would take forever to get to the positives if I talked about the negatives first. So, the good things about this game. The art design of this game has perfected the paper design of the Paper Mario series. The game does tend to focus too much on the paper though, but- No, stop it, stop it, Tyler. You said you were only going to do the positives. No negatives allowed! Find me. The music in this game is good. Not the best. Ta 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 ta. Negatives. Okay, I'm sorry. The music keeps you feeling happy though, which really does help the player move along in the game because there's really not much else. Negative. You know what? Fuck it. I tried. This game is a fucking disgrace to the Paper Mario games. There, pause it is over. Negative time. The combat in this game is atrocious. I don't understand what people were talking about when they dissed on the combat. It returns Paper Mario to its turn-based combat roots. But there's two massive design issues with the system that cause massive issues. Number one, there is no XP in this game for winning fights. In fact, there's no XP in this game at all. The only way that I guess you could say leveling up is your HP by finding these little random heart containers that give you five extra health. But removing the XP from combat is the biggest problem because there is now no point to fighting enemies. And this leads in nicely to my second point. The only time you can do a move in this game is if you have a sticker for that action. And that is exactly what it sounds like. If you want to jump, you have to have a jumping sticker. But what if you're against a flying opponent and you don't have a jumping sticker, I hear you asked. Well, too fucking bad, because you're shit out of luck. I discovered this on World 1-3, only an hour into the game, that if I waste my stickers on just common little enemies, 
then when I go against a boss or a mini boss or whatever, I'm gonna be at a complete disadvantage because I'm not gonna have any stickers to go against them. And no, you know what? There is a third bad thing about the combat. The boss fights. You see, scattered throughout the land, there are these things called things. Things are real 3D objects like a fan, but some bosses pretty much require you to have certain things to beat them. Now, why is this so horrible? Well, you see, to use a thing in combat, you have to make it a sticker, which takes up space in your inventory where your stickers go. And your inventory isn't unlimited. There is a limited amount of space that can only be upgraded at the end of every boss fight. This means you're wasting precious inventory space for a goddamn stapler. I absolutely hate the things in this game. Some puzzles require certain things to be able to progress. There is a lot of backtracking in this game, and I mean a lot. If you hate backtracking as much as I hate backtracking, you in this game are going to have massive issues down the road. Previous Paper Marios had had backtracking, but it was nowhere near this level. And even if you did have to go back to your previous level, there was always something different to make it worthwhile to go back. We will have to go from World 4-2 to World 1-3 to get a thing that you missed all that time ago. How does that make any sense? If you got the item originally on your first time in World 1-3, you've been holding onto that item for 8 hours by the time you reach 4-2. And you might have already used it in battle because you thought it was just a useless item. Then you have to backtrack all the way to where you originally got it, and some things are tedious to get. So, a little small thing in here. There's a new item in this game that is Mario's classic invincibility star. But it's so unsatisfying here. You will run into an enemy, and all they do is slowly spin around, puff into smoke, and then die. Most of the game is pretty much Paper Mario 64. Most of the worlds in this game are pretty boring and bland. We're just going through the same exact desert we've gone through dozens of times now. What? what are those? Are those supposed to be Koopas? I... uh... <laughs> God. <laughs> that was so bad. That was horrible. The only good section of this game has to be World 3. You have to help a wiggler by finding all four segments of his body. The search for the segments send you on a fun journey, and it actually feels like I was doing something for a change. I was saving more than just a forest, but an actual living being. I thought that maybe this game was pulling a Super Paper Mario where it actually becomes fun. But nope! Immediately following this, the game actually gets worse. Well, I... I mean, it's not... You know, some guys just like to eat out is all. The end of the game has Mario traveling to Bowser's castle, where he meets an enemy he's met several times by this point. A super bland magic Koopa that looks like Kamek. Okay. Can I talk about the characters in this? Every single character in this game look all the same. There are so many toads in this game. Like at least 75% of the characters in this game had to have been toads. But back to what I was talking to. After you defeat Kamek, he literally turns in the actual dust. I think he's dead. I think if there is a way to die in Mario, this is how you die. Once you defeat Kamek, you head to the final room. Wait, Peach was kidnapped? I mean, I know that I should have assumed that she was, but the game never even shows her being taken by Bowser. Then everybody's favorite villain falls from the sky and engages battle on Mario. In classic Paper Mario fashion, the final boss is hard, but since the combat is already so skewed, it's hard for all the wrong reasons. I'm sorry, but this boss fight is literally impossible if you do not use the right Thing stickers at the right stage of battle. Near the end of the fight, Mario throws Bowser off the side of his castle, but he then returns in a massive sticker monster form. He has an insane amount of health, and attacks on him only do one piece of damage against him. Seeing how the odds are terrible for Mario, Kirsty allows Mario to use her as a sticker, which kills her. Oh my god, Paper Mario! Super Paper Mario was dark but never killed its characters quite like you did! Mario literally sucks the life out of Kirsty! With her sacrifice, Mario becomes super strong and beats Bowser. Mario frees Peach and the final sticker crown from Bowser is given to Mario. All six stickers light up and Mario is now allowed to make his very own wish. And 
what did he wish for? Well, of course he wishes for a whole new sticker festival! Or at least that's what I thought anyways. Of course, Mario does the right thing and returns Kirsty back to life. Whoopee. Oh, but what's that in the background? Is that Bowser trying to get the sticker comment again? When Kirsty sees Bowser doing this, she scolds him and says that she needs to find a new job. Which, wait, is, is that Bowser laughing there at the end? Could this whole thing have possibly been faked the entire time? Could it be possible that we made friends with Bowser at the end of Super Paper Mario and we were all just having some fun? Fuck if I know, I'm just trying to make sense about why Bowser is laughing at the end there. So, now that I'm done with all that stuff, Nintendo, what have you created? What have you done? How did you go from Aliens 2 to Alien Resurrection in just one game? Usually you have a slow decline in quality over a series, not a massive drop-off. Like, how did you even manage that? I had complete faith in you. It feels like Sticker Star wants you to hate it, and it hates you for hating it. These royal stickers look like they're flipping me off. There is no unique characters. Super Paper Mario had like one toad in the entire game. Sticker Star's entire cast is almost all toads. Nintendo, did you really think people were that bummed out that there were no toads in the last game? So you decided to make everybody in this game a toad? Worst of all, there's no Bowser humor. Bowser doesn't speak a word in this entire game. The big boss, who is usually pretty mouthy and funny, and not only Paper Mario, but Mario RPGs in general is super bland. Super bland Bowser belongs in the mainstream Mario games, not Paper Mario. I've said it already, but this game is pretty much another attempt at Paper Mario 64, but falls flat on its face. If you've played this game, you know what I'm talking about. The worlds in this are just more boring versions of the locations you visited in Paper Mario 64. Mario's running animation is even the same. This game just feels so much like the original, but so different at the same time. I mean, at least some of my favorite enemies like the Shy Guys finally made a return. I really don't know if this was like a warning or something from Nintendo to everybody that they could destroy any series they wanted in a snap of a finger. Is this because nobody likes Skyward Sword? Sticker Star was meant to be a true Paper Mario game with a story in life. Instead, all we got was a carcass. There's even screenshots of the game with Mario with a partner. Whoever went to Intelligent Systems from Nintendo and said, mm, You see what you got right here? This, this game's too good. Too much like that's in your door. Make it bad, you know, to make it stand out. I never want them near my Paper Mario ever again. You know what I think we can all agree on? Even if you didn't like Super Paper Mario, you see that game as the beginning of the end for Paper Mario as we knew it? I think we can all agree that at least that game had personality. This game is like Hannibal Lecter. It's just wearing Mario's face. It is amazing what the original trilogy evolved into. In my opinion, the series kept getting better with each new iteration. If you had told me that a sequel to Paper Mario 64 would have become one of the best stories I've ever heard, I wouldn't have believed you. Nintendo? Maybe for some reason, you don't want Paper Mario to ever be like it used to be. But please don't take the game's charm away from it in the process. At the very least, give us something like Super Paper Mario, but with a much stronger core gameplay. 
It's not that Sticker Star was a disappointment was why it was bad. Some great sequels had disappointing aspects about them, but Sticker Star was bad because of what it represents. It doesn't realize what made previous Paper Mario games a success. A diverse cast of characters, clever dialogue, and a world that led to fun gameplay is what made Paper Mario so good. All Sticker Star cares about is paper and nothing else. Now, the new Paper Mario game, Color Splash, is set to come out in just a few months, and all I can do is pray that it is good. Even though it looks completely like Sticker Star, the last thing I want is for another Paper Mario game to flop. What I think we can all agree on is that we don't want to see Paper Mario be forgotten in time. Thank you so much for watching, and have a good day.